The fourth video in this series on intracranial infections is going to talk about special considerations in immunocompromised patients. In the previous videos, we've talked about general principles in evaluating infection, some diffuse infections such as encephalitis and ventriculitis. We've talked about focal walled off infections or abscess. And in this video, we'll talk about some special considerations in immunocompromised patients. Finally, in our last video, we'll talk about a few uh, other kind of special infections you might think about. So immunocompromised is common. Uh, you'll most often see it in patients with HIV, although you have to think about some other considerations like lymphoma or leukemia, patients on chemotherapy, or patients on immune suppression for other reasons. Common reasons you'll see patients on immune suppression are transplant, and uh, if they have autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis, in patients with immunocompromise, there are a few things you want to think about when you're looking at the brain. Uh, one of them is HIV leukencephalopathy. You want to think about toxoplasmosis and cryptococcus, and then finally PML. So these are things that you think about more in immunocompromised patients. So HIV encephalopathy is a condition in which the HIV virus directly causes a leukencephalopathy. In HIV encephalopathy, you get bilateral symmetric white matter abnormalities. They tend to progressively worsen over time, and they're directly caused by the HIV virus. So here you see a 59-year-old patient who has a CD4 count of 169. He has his seizure disorder and substance abuse, and now he's altered. And what you can see is on flare here, there's some subtle bilateral symmetric white matter abnormality. So it's a little bit too bright here where you should normally be seeing white matter. Um, otherwise, it looks pretty normal. I mean, diffusion's pretty normal. T1 pre-contrast is pretty normal. There's no enhancement. There's no gradient abnormality there. Just a subtle flare abnormality in the paraventricular white matter. Now, if you move on a little bit later, and you can see this actually progress over time. So this is the initial images that we saw. They're from 2015. If you move on about nine months later, you see that white matter abnormality is getting worse. You see progressive volume loss, so the ventricles are getting larger, and the white matter is looking definitely worse. If you go on another uh, couple of years, the white matter is now diffusely abnormal in all of the paraventricular regions. The volume loss is worse. And so again, this is now what HIV encephalopathy looks like. It's symmetric, it's bilateral, it tends to progress with time. Toxoplasmosis is a multifocal infection in the brain. Its most common location is going to be the basal ganglia. Usually, unlike abscess, it doesn't have reduced diffusion. You can have what's called the target sign, where you see a bit of a bullseye or a rim of enhancement with, uh, with central hyperintensity. Uh, so here you see a patient who's a 33-year-old woman coming in with a very low CD4 count of 16. On flare, you see multifocal areas of abnormality. So you see hyperintensity here. You see some abnormality in and around the ventricle here. Uh, here you just see up higher, you see a little bit more. Here you see on pre-contrast, uh, there's no intrinsic T1 hyperintensity. But then these lesions are avidly enhancing. So you see this lesion in the anterior cingulate enhancing, uh, lesions in the frontal lobe enhancing. And here you see a little bit of that target sign. So you have a little bit of a bullseye. We have an outer rim, and here you see it again. So an outer rim of enhancement with a central area of enhancement there. That's the target sign, which is often seen in toxoplasmosis. Now here you see diffusion on that same patient, and you can see the areas where those lesions are are not nearly as bright as those that you might see from an abscess. So that's more typical of toxoplasmosis. Now, it can be difficult to differentiate toxoplasmosis and lymphoma. Uh, lymphoma is the most common space-occupying lesion in HIV. Uh, some features you can use is it tends to be hyper-dense on CT. So if you see areas that are very dense on CT, the areas of enhancement often have reduced diffusion. It tends to be solid enhancement. Uh, periventricular involvement tends to be, uh, so if you have mass-like enlargement around the, the ventricles, uh, that, can be, uh, that can be an issue. So think about lymphoma. You can do tests to try to differentiate these, although it can be challenging. CSF collection can be used to look for lymphoma cells in the CSF. Oftentimes, the easiest and most straightforward way is to try someone on toxoplasmosis therapy without steroids for a week or two and see if they get better. Lymphoma will tend to be worse or stay the same. Now, you can't give them steroids because both toxoplasmosis and lymphoma will respond to steroids. 
lymphoma will respond very well to steroids. Thallium scan is a nuclear medicine scan in which uh, you give thallium. Lymphoma is known to take up thallium, whereas toxoplasmosis does not. Although this is prone to some interpretation problems and can be a little challenging, you can definitely have indeterminate findings. So that tends to be a test of last resort. This is a four-week follow-up on that same patient. You can see that the areas of flare abnormality have gotten a lot better. You see there's much less edema than on post-contrast imaging. You can see there's just a few little dots of enhancement, but the mass effect and everything has gotten a lot better. So within a month of starting treatment, there's been drastic improvement there, which you would not typically see uh, with lymphoma without treatment. Now this is an immunocompromised patient uh, with HIV who has lymphoma. Here you can see uh, on the head CT, there's a lot of edema on the bilateral frontal lobes, some mass effect and enlargement of this mass around the left frontal horn here, some edema in the adjacent white matter. So in that periventricular distribution, while it can be infection, you really have to be attuned to lymphoma. This was a 50 year old patient with HIV who was altered. Here you see the images from the patient's MRI you see on diffusion, there's a little bit more of a diffusion abnormality on DWI, so it's kind of bright. On ADC, it's somewhat dark, particularly in those periventricular regions. That's sort of intermediate on flare or T2. On post-contrast imaging, you have a lot of peripheral enhancement uh, around here. So you can kind of see, and especially in immunocompromised patients, lymphoma may be a little bit less solid. But this pattern of enhancement around the subependable margins with enlargement is pretty classic for lymphoma. This patient went on to get biopsied and be documented to have lymphoma. Finally, one other thing you should think about is cryptococcus and uh, can certainly have multiple manifestations. Uh, the most common one that you'll hear about is a basilar meningitis or this description of pseudocysts or gelatinous pseudocysts, which fill up the perivascular spaces of the basal ganglia. Now that's um, manifested as you have these multiple cystic lesions in the basal ganglia. They may have enhancement, but more often than not, it's minimal. Here you see a 25 year old with HIV and headache who's positive for HIV. The cryptococcal antigen is positive and you can see these perivascular spaces are very enlarged in the basal ganglia. Now, sometimes you can see these in older patients who have a lot of volume loss, but it would be very unusual for a 25 year old to have this much uh, enlarged perivascular space. So when the cryptococcal antigen is positive and other tests point towards cryptococcus, uh, this is most likely going to be an active case of cryptococcus. Now here on post-contrast imaging, there's very little, if any, enhancement there. So again, you see that enhancement is not a key feature of this infection. Another special consideration you want to make in patients with immune compromise is PML, or progressive multifocal leukencephalopathy. This is a disease of the white matter, which is caused by reactivation of the JC virus. You can see this in immunocompromised patients, most commonly those with HIV or on immunosuppression, uh, particularly some MS therapies. The treatment for PML is to, if you have HIV, is to start uh, antiretroviral drugs and bring the immune system back. If you are on immune suppression for MS, for instance, then you must uh, stop the immunosuppression. The imaging appearance of PML, unlike HIV leukencephalopathy, is it tends to be asymmetric and uh, subcortical, so less around the ventricles and more in a subcortical location. It tends to be more T1 hypointense, a little bit darker. And characteristically, it does not enhance. So here you see a case of a 44-year-old man coming in with HIV encephalopathy and cognitive issues with a very low CD4 count. On diffusion, you see areas of hyperintensity, particularly in the subcortical white matter, and U-fibers. You see this appearance on flare and diffusion. Uh, the involvement of the U-fibers is characteristic only of a few uh, diseases, particularly demyelinating diseases such as MS and PML. Now you see on diffusion, it's somewhat bright, but again, scattered lesions, asymmetric, per predominantly involving the subcortical white matter. Here you see pre and post contrast imaging. So you, you see those areas which were involved are quite dark on T1. You see patchy areas of loss of myelin essentially with uh, essentially no associated enhancement. Now here I've brought up the picture of the person from before who has HIV encephalopathy, just to show you how bilaterally symmetric and diffuse it is in comparison to this person who has PML, where it's subcortical, asymmetric, and focal. In summary, immunocompromised patients are susceptible to a different set of CNS infections than people with the normal immune system, with the main things you have to think about being HIV leukencephalopathy, toxoplasmosis, 
Cryptococcus and PML. There are a couple of key confounders that you have to think about. Toxoplasmosis and lymphoma can be somewhat challenging to differentiate and can require a trial of toxoplasmosis therapy. PML versus HIV encephalopathy, there can be some overlap, but think about those distinctions, whether it's symmetric and bilateral versus irregular and subcortical. Thanks for tuning into this video. In our last video infection, we're going to talk about other considerations. We have a few special infections that you might think about that have a characteristic appearance. So tune back in for that video and thanks.